All right, I'm going to continue my marathon of recording lectures. I got behind this semester, so some intense days. Um, we're going to break this one into two parts, where first we do the introductory material, and uh, we do a lecture, and then I'm going to have a second video that um, that has the has the examples. Okay, so for an introduction to so the first law of thermodynamics is more or less conservation of energy. Um, so this is um, this can tell you the thermodynamics tells you how temperatures change. Thermo meaning temperature, dynamics mean change, um, and thermodynamics can tell you what's going on um, as in particular often gases or fluids move around. So here you see. Um, smog moving across China. Um, uh, this an understanding of thermodynamics is under, important for understanding the weather. Um, and the first thing that we have to do is we have to define the system. So if you have a system, you're, de you're defining some boundary between it and the rest of the world. Um, so you have system and surroundings. And you often are looking at, for instance, the energy of the system as it does work or has work done on it by the by the outside world. <clears throat> so um, then on this side, what you see is a cylinder of a car engine. You can use this as the system. You define this as the system, and the system is going to the the cylinder is going to do work and have work done on it. Um, by the um, by the piston and the rest of it is surroundings now the this is always ultimately somewhat arbitrary it can depend on what question you're trying to answer where you would draw the um, the boundary for that system so in the case um, of the the car um, the cylinder of a car engine you want to talk about how much work is done um, by the engine, you probably, then it makes sense to draw the system as shown. If you were talking about, say, a car crash, you don't necessarily care about the details of the engine, so you might draw a bigger box around the entire car. Um, so a tea kettle is an example of an open system. It allows heat and matter to go in and out. A pressure cooker is really close to a closed system, although there's always this little escape. Um, there's an escape valve so that you don't blow the entire thing up. And actually, pressure cookers used improperly can be quite dangerous. All right, so then a lot of what we're working with here is um, work and PV or pressure volume diagrams. So if you have a gas and the gas is expanding, the gas can do work. Um, and the force is given by the pressure times the area. So remember that pressure is a measure of the um, pressure is a measure of the force per unit area. So if you want the actual force on this piston, you multiply the pressure times the area, and that gives you the force. The work is the force times the distance. So the fresh, so you can actually <coughs> relate the work done to PdV. So we're going to be using this particular result that the, um, and I actually will probably default to using an uppercase P um, dV, somewhat to distinguish it between the um, for instance, the density, which we often use rho, which kind of looks like a P. So the amount of work in a, done by a small, uh, a small amount of work done by an infinitesimal process is going to be the pressure times dV. And we're going to use that to derive a lot of other stuff. OK. So here um, you see. In a PV diagram, you see the, the system going from one point to another. Um, and so far, we haven't specified what this line is. And a lot depends on what this line is. Um, and if you have, broadly, if you have a process that takes a gas from this point to that point, then the work done is the area under the curve. Um, and you actually can 
However you do it, you can calculate the area under the curve. Now, this is still a class that has calculus as a co-requisite, not a prerequisite. Um, so we will often, I'm going to use do some derivations that use integrals, but um, you're not, you are given the answers in the text. I do think it's useful if you have seen that it involves an integral so that when you see it again, it's not totally new. Okay, so here you have four different points and you have, can have different ways of going along that point and they're going to have different um, amounts of work. So remember work is the area under the curve. So if you go from A to B to C, you do more work than if you go from A to C this way and more work than if you do A to D to C. Um, so they are all quasi-static, meaning that they happen um, slow enough that you don't have to worry about things being out of equilibrium. Um, and if you, um, when you change between two states, whatever is going on, however you get there, the change in the internal energy um, is going to be the same. What can change is, um, so, if you go different ways, the change in the internal energy, which is related to the temperature, stays the same. Often we're talking about gases. So if you use the ideal gas law, here you have the pressure and the volume fixed. So the temperature has a certain value. And then you have the same, you can, if you know the pressure and the volume here, you know the temperature as well. Um, so the temperature is related to the internal energy. Your system doesn't care how it goes there. The internal energy is the same. What can happen is the amount of work done and the amount of heat transferred in the process can be different, but the change in internal energy is the same. So in a quasi-static process, the path is known more or less exactly. In a non-quasi-process, which we will mostly not be dealing with, you don't know how it went from A to B um, and you can't really draw a clear path. If we don't know how it got there, we can't really work with it very well. So here's an example of a system expanding at constant temperature. Um, so you have your piston, for instance, in a heat bath. So it stays at a, a fixed tension uh, temperature. And then when you remove the weights, the piston, um, the system stays at the same temperature but you are changing the, um, you are, all right, so when you um, release a piston, you're um, changing, you're letting the, the system push the, when you move one of the masses off, you are letting the piston push up the gas and you're changing the pressure in here because it is expanding and you're changing the volume. So you're actually doing work here, but at constant temperature. So this is an example of how you would have a process at constant temperature, which is called an isotherm. Um, <clears throat> so here you can actually, at least for an ideal gas, because PV equals NRT, so if you have something at constant temperature, since you have the ideal gas law, you can just go ahead and plot the path that that takes um, on your PV diagram. Now that's assuming that you do this slowly enough that you don't ever let um, the temperature change. So for example, if you very suddenly yanked all of those masses off, it might not happen slow enough. There might be a temperature change before you, um, <clears throat> before the system reached equilibrium again. And then you wouldn't know exactly how much, um, you wouldn't be able to draw the exact PV diagram. Um, so here you can have an insulated piston and the ho hot compressed gas is released. As the piston moves up, the volume expands. Um, and the temperature and the pressure decrease. The internal energy goes into work. If the expansion occurs um, <clears throat> within, 
within a time frame where you can't get heat entering the system, then the process is called adiabatic. So that means that you don't have, if you totally insulate it, you're not letting heat in or out, you're just allowing the system to do work. Adiabatic, actually, we haven't talked about entropy yet, but adiabatic corresponds to constant entropy. So we talk about isothermal, which is constant temperature, isobaric, which is constant pressure, um, isochoric, which is constant volume, and then adiabatic, which is constant entropy. Um, <clears throat> And depending on how you construct the system, you might have different, um, you can have different, you can engineer different types of processes. So here, if you have the piston fixed, then it's, it's constant volume or isochoric. And if you have the, um, if you let the piston move up and down, it has, it is um, staying in equilibrium with the room, so it is constant pressure. Um, you can also talk about if you have, um, you have chambers in, in a container and you open them. So now, you know, here, when the chambers are totally separated, you have one equilibrium state, and then you're allowing the gas to expand into the other. So the gas is actually ex expand, is doing work. And here's another way you can engineer an adiabatic or constant entropy process. So you keep the system entirely um, thermally isolated, and then you're slowly removing the sand. Um, so, so you're slowly removing the weight so that you don't ever get out of equilibrium and then you're keeping the entropy constant, so it's roughly adiabatic. Um, and adiabatic um, processes have sl a slightly different form than isothermal, so on a PV diagram, they're gonna do slightly different amounts of work. And we're gonna stop here and save the um, examples for a different video. So see you for the next.